Okay, we've been talking about the text of prayer, um, and now I would like to take a look at the core of the Shabbos text. Um, this edition of the Siddur is on 341. The last paragraph on the, pra- on the page is the paragraph that you have in all of the uh, four prayers of, of Shabbos. And then the other is material that you that varies from, from, uh, the, from one to the other. So I'm going to look now about, at the part that's in common to all of them. Let's read through the paragraph first, and then we'll go through it uh, piece by piece. Our God and the God of our forefathers, may you be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us with your commandments and grant us our share in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness and gladden us with your salvation. And purify our heart to serve you sincerely. O Hashem, our God, with love and favor, grant us your holy Sabbath as a heritage. And may Israel, the sacrifices of your name, sanctifiers of your name, rest on it. Because Hashem who sanctifies the Sabbath. So first of all, we need to understand the meaning of each of these different phrases, and then maybe we can do a little bit about the order, at least part of the order. First of all, it says, may you be pleased with our rest. Now here, the word in the Hebrew is retzei, and we said that that word refers to receiving a sacrifice favorably. Is a bit of a challenge. I'm saying to Akash Baruch Hu, my rest on Shabbos you should receive as a sacrifice. You know, if I do some spectacular mitzvah for Akash Baruch Hu, or if I actually bring a sacrifice in the temple, I can say, okay, I've served you, and you should receive what I did in your name as a, as a sacrifice that you should be pleased with. But here we're talking about my rest. Isn't the rest sort of what I do for myself? You know, I'm tired. I work. Shabbos, I don't work, so I have some time off. That doesn't sound right if I'm asking that the Kodesh Baruch should accept it as a sacrifice. So let's take a look at this. One of the things that we say about Shabbos is that it is a memorial to the Exodus from Egypt. And the commentators ask, how is that? How is Shabbos a memorial to the Exodus? On what day of the week did we leave Egypt? Well, according to most opinions, we received the Torah on Shabbos. So if it's 50 days before, then it's going to be on Friday. And 51 days before, because there's some one uh, opinion that says that Moses added extra day, it'd be, be Thursday. Not, neither of them say we left Egypt on Shabbos. So in what way is Shabbos a memorial to the Exodus? So the Rambam says the following. The key performance on Shabbos is to refrain from malacha. 39 different categories of physically creative effort. How is it that we can do that? How is it that we're able to just simply say, on Shabbos, I'm not doing those things. In Egypt, you couldn't do that. In Egypt, you had taskmasters. And they ran you seven days a week, 365 days a year. The fact that you can choose not to do melacha on Shabbos is because the Kodesh Baruch Hu took us out of the slavery of Egypt. So a, a Jew with a historical consciousness, when Shabbos comes in and he has set himself up a mode of, of, 
of existing for the next 25 hours without doing any malacha should think, I got here because the Kodesh Baruch Hu took us out of Egypt. That's the cause of my ability to be able to stop doing malacha. When you do that, automatically, if you're, if you're filled with gratitude to Kodesh Baruch Hu, that he put you in a position where you can stop doing malacha, your rest now, in the sense of not doing malacha, that rest has been dedicated to gratitude to Kodesh Baruch Hu. So that's a very simple way in which you could ask that your expression of that gratitude, your feeling and identification with that gratitude, should be re- received as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a sacrifice. And in this context, I want to point out that R-E-S-T in English does not automatically carry all the connotations of relaxed muscles and regaining your strength and sleeping well and so forth and so on. Imagine describing someone who's playing golf as you have, you can't imagine. He teed off and the ball landed on the green and came to rest four inches from the cup. That's certainly an appropriate way to talk. It doesn't mean that the ball was lounging in 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 a lounge chair and sipping a martini, and, you know, and enjoying deep rhythmic breathing, came to rest means stopped moving. That's all. Rest is the opposite of motion. So here, we could take rest in its minimal sense of stopping to do physically creative actions. The malachas. And that being the case, is already, in a certain sense, dedicated to a Kodesh Baruch. That's one thing. Secondly, It would be, it's an interesting exercise to take a look at the laws of Shabbos and classify them as whether they are biblical or whether they're rabbinic. I think the only biblical law for Shabbos that's positive, that requires you to do something, is Kiddush. Wow, a whole 45 seconds to say a paragraph in Hebrew, a couple of paragraphs, and then sit down and drink some wine. Over! The rest of the biblical commandments are all don't do malach. Just to drink wine? No, I said say two paragraphs in Hebrew and drink, and drink wine. Why would you drink wine? I'm sorry, say again? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. You're right. I, 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 I put in, in too much. I, I put in, you're right. Biblical, biblically, it's only to, to, to recite the paragraph. Uh, the, the drinking the wine is only, is only the Rabbanon. So for the rest of the 25 hours, all of it is negative. We have lots and lots of things we do only on Shabbos, right? We have the meals, and we have special prayers, and we have special songs that we sing, and all, all of that is rabbinic. We dress in special clothes, rabbinic. Indeed, if you thought of it, what would a biblical Shabbos be like? It would be really stripped down. I usually put this as a question. I didn't do it tonight, but I ask, imagine someone who makes a kid Friday night and drinks the wine and goes to sleep and sleeps 25 hours. What biblical Shabbos commandment did he miss? And the answer is none. So, the, 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 the rest of it is only, the negative part is, is, is biblical, and all the rest of it is rabbinic. Well, the truth is, it's a little more subtle than that. Because, um, Um, I guess you have it back here. Yeah. On page 336, just before the Shemun Esri on Friday night, we say the paragraph of Shamu. And there it says, Shabbos Well, I'll read it here. Children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to make it the Sabbath an eternal covenant. An eternal covenant. Please so long. Hmm. Between me and the children of Israel, it is a sign forever. So it's a covenant and a sign. And in particular, it's a sign that in six days, Hashem made heaven and earth. 
On the seventh day, rested, meaning he stopped creating, and was refreshed, whatever that means. So now, let's imagine this guy who makes Kiddush Friday night, takes a drink of wine, and sleeps for 25 hours. Does that sound to you like a sign? Snoring away up there in the bedroom? Like, you know, what kind of sign is that? If you watched it, what would you be seeing? And it's a covenant that you fulfill by sleeping for 25 hours? That's an easy one. So now, I know this from Rabbi Meisland. So now, when the rabbis instituted the behaviors for Shabbos, they did so in order to fulfill these biblical themes. So that means that even though the authority behind the mitzvahs of Shabbos is rabbinic, and someone who, God forbid, violates it is violating only a, 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 a um, rabbinic commandment, but the impact of the, of the, of the, of the mitzvahs is to fulfill these biblical themes. So now, when you take a look at a Jew's behavior on Shabbos, when he fulfills all of the rabbinic rules for Shabbos, that's what he's doing while he ceases to perform malacha. That's his rest time. And that could be offered as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, a gift to a Gersh Baruch. The Torah that he learns and the um, songs that he sings at the meals and the meals themselves, the banquets, all of that now is the rabbinic rules for celebrating Shabbos. And that celebration can be offered to a Gersh Baruch Hu as a as a, as, a, as a korban, as a sacrifice. So that now gives a, a positive meaning to the idea of offering a person's rest to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Sanctify us with your commandments. We spoke about that. Either that when you perform a commandment, you thereby acquire a certain sanctity for yourself. I shouldn't say or. And also when he gave us the commandments at Sinai, he elevated us to the point where we were able to perform and affect the world the way that the commandments are, are supposed to do. That gave us a special sanctity. Give us our portion in your Torah. We spoke about that also, that it's here after sanctify us with like your commandments because the goal of all life is to achieve attachment to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. The, the, the Zohar says that that's the goal, Vekas. And that's the goal into which the study of Torah fits. And here we're talking about the purpose. The purpose is to become attached to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And the study of Torah is one of the chief ways in which we achieve that. And that's why it comes after <coughs> sanctifies through your commandments. There's a word here that we haven't studied before, and that is, give us our portion. Hmm. The Torah has portions. The Torah has, has independent, or I shouldn't say independent, but different elements in it. And apparently some elements could be our portion and other elements couldn't. And it's only appropriate to ask for our portion. I'm not asking for the whole thing. I'm only asking for a portion. That's not exactly obvious. And the answer is that it's true though it's not necessary. There are people who master the whole Torah. But even the ones who master the whole Torah typically emphasize one part of Torah more than another part of Torah. One area that's, that's usually a matter of selective emphasis is the responsive literature. We have ma many people, many. There are people who master the whole of the Talmud and all the commentaries and the uh, Shulchan Aruch and the commentaries but don't master the entire response to literature. And there are people who e emphasize giving practical uh, answers, and they master the response to literature, which is vast, and they have a background in the other, but they don't emphasize it uh, uh, so much. So that even for a person who covers the whole, he doesn't cover all of it equally. And that means that there's some portion which is more his por uh, portion, than other portions which are less his portion. Um, and it's appropriate to think that way. Uh, let's put it this way. It's appropriate. 
I belong to a certain subculture that holds that way. I think there are others who disagree, and there are many ways to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu. There are those who think that there's only one thing that everybody has to have, and if you have that, you're a success. If you don't have that, you're a failure. My background, particular Hasidic background, says that no, different people have different abilities and different natural uh, attachments, and that although one should, the Ramchal says, one should have some experience with, if possible, all the different categories of Torah, but it's perfectly appropriate to specialize in the part where you feel most connected. Having over, covered basic halacha and basic hashkafa understanding, um, then to emphasize the part where you feel most connected. So now, that's where I feel most connected, but of course, I'm not going to get it because I'm in charge, because I'm running the, 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 uh, the show. I have to ask a Kodesh Baruch Hu for help in giving it to me. Now, this is in the Shabbos prayers. That's not obvious. Why, uh, why would that be part of the Shabbos prayers? We don't have it in the weekday prayers. In the Shemana Esri. They're always saying, yes, but Shabbos Baruch should bring us to his Torah. That said, doesn't speak about our portion. It's in the Hirat zone. After the Shemona Esrei, we pray for the rebuilding of the temple. There's very same phrases there. That's something else. We talked about that. That the temple was a way in which Torah came into the world as well. <clears throat> so here, I think one could say that um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I have an idea here from the, from the Belzer Rebbe. Uh, it should be well and strong. Um, when we say that the purpose of every mitzvah is attachment to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, that's true. That's what the Zohar says. But you could subdivide. Every mitzvah's purpose is attachment. But some mitzvahs, in addition to having attachment as their purpose, express attachment now. They're devoted to expressing the attachment, acknowledging the attachment, applying the attachment, whereas the other ones are just means to it, the attachment. But they don't express the attachment in that way. And he, the Belzer Rebbe, wanted to use this to explain that there are certain mitzvahs where we say to the wicked person, don't do those mitzvahs. Only a few. We don't tell the wicked person, don't keep kosher. We don't tell the wicked person, don't bench after meals. We tell the wicked person, don't study Torah. Why are you discussing my, my laws? Filas atoim toeva. The, the prayer of a, the wicked person is an abomination. Malachim Ramos Chatzerai, why are you trampling my courtyards coming into the temple? Shabbatchem v'modichem son anafshi, your Shabbos and your holidays, my soul hates. These are things where Chodesh Baruch says, the person's a Russia, I don't want him to do that. The other person is not like that. doesn't say that he shouldn't read Megillah and Purim. What is it that makes these, these messages different? So this is what the, what the Belzer Rebbe said. I think this was 1977, actually. Um, he said that the, a mitzvah that expresses being in a condition of connection for the Russia to do that is like living a lie. Whereas a mitzvah doesn't express that, but it's just dedicated to achieving that as a means to that, wouldn't be living a lie. So, learning Torah, you're supposed to be acquiring a Kodesh Baruch Hu's communication to you. You're supposed to be embodying a Kodesh Baruch Hu's will and wisdom. If the person is wicked, not doing that, then it's a... Then it's a like Ramchal says in the Derech Hashem, 
It's like using the king's crown as a, you know, as a paperweight or to, you know, eat soup out of or something. It's an abomination because this thing is, 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 is infinitely holy and using it for an inappropriate purpose. Tefillah, you're standing before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The whole posture of prayer is being there. And this person is thinking about the stock market or thinking about, you know, other things. Coming into the temple, the temple is where HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes his presence felt. You come there in order to be connected, not in order to achieve connection it's 75 years later when you're going to die. No, this is a time of connection now. You're not coming in for that purpose. Because Baruch says, you're trampling my, my courtyards. Shabbos and holidays are times when Baruch Baruch makes himself available for that connection. That's the, the purpose of the, perp, of the mitzvah is living the connection. Not again as a, as a means to, a connection, to the connection in the world to come. So those are the, those are the ones where you have this... this uh, now, here, Shabbos is one of them, where the connection is available, and Torah is one of them, which also is an experience of the connection. So here, that would be one way to connect why here in the Shabbos framework we're asking for, a, for a, our share in the Torah, because that's uh, one of the means of being connected here and now. And Shabbos is a time when you're connected here and now, so it, it's incorporated into the petitions that you have in the Shemun Esri and Shabbos. Yeah, very good. Um, about the, the parts of the Torah, so people have different parts of, of the Torah, um, wouldn't it be more like, the way I used to think about it was like a person has, a person's neshama connects to certain parts of the Torah. It seems to me, person's neshama connects to certain parts of the Torah because it's not really that it's you could say that there's a part of the infinite but rather it's like uh, it's like uh, certain certain directions I guess certain directions within the Torah uh, I don't know it sounds like you're you feel you're facing a problem and you're trying to figure out a way to get around the problem it sounds like the problem you're facing is that the Torah is infinite and therefore something's hard to deal with. So, first of all, um, I think that the idea of the Torah being infinite would refer to depth, but not breadth. That's why I said before there are people who master the whole of the Torah. That means to say, all of the literature that we have, they know. They've learned it all. That is a conceivable thing to do because the literature is finite. The depth of the literature, of course, the literature has no end, no end to depth. But that—that's not what I was I was referring to. But now, talking about our portion in Torah, for the vast, vast majority of people, that means breadth. The vast majority of us are not going to get to all of the breadth of the Torah. And these words are telling us that that's legitimate. There are some places, as you said, where your soul is more connected, and it's appropriate to emphasize those places. For the vast majority of people, emphasize means and leave other things undone. Uh, For those gifted few, very zealous few, who manage to cover the entire breadth, then it will apply to variations in depth for, for the different, so the words will apply to them as well. But the words apply to almost everybody, almost everybody in terms of, of breadth. Now, I'll just tell you, we, we, I, I said before that it's a matter of categories. There's certain categories, and if you have, the, I, I don't know where I heard this from, but there's, there's that idea that any, any category that you have some connection with, you'll be connected to in the world to come. But if you have no connection with that whole category, then uh, in the world to come, you won't have any connection. So when I heard that, I decided, what about the Yerushalmi? I don't want to be cut out of the Yerushalmi in the world to come. So for a period of time, I'm doing the Daf Yomi for many, many years, Baruch Hashem, I learned the Yerushalmi Masechta, which is the same of the Babli Masechta that I was doing in the Daf Yomi. Okay, so that's where I learned, I don't know, five, six, seven receptors of Yerushalmi. I don't have to finish the Yerushalmi. I learned some Yerushalmi. Now, what about the Zohar? Yeah, 
people who are watching the video. What about the Zohar? You don't want to be cut out of the Zohar in the world to come. That doesn't mean you have to spend six years mastering the whole Zohar. Oh, take some portion, take one parsha, and go through the Zohar, whatever it is. So you say, yes, I've been there. Yes, I touched that. But that means all the rest of it is, is I'm not, I'm not working on now. I'm not going to say that I won't get there someday, but I'm not working on now. So that's, that's the sense of the portion that we're talking about. And yes, that, that portion is where your soul connects. No, no. Um, so now, the, I, don't think, I don't think that there's a problem here because of the infinity, meaning the infinity of depth. There's no, there isn't any problem in, in the description that I just gave, the description of choosing in the breadth where you want to expend your efforts. I don't think that there's... I can't hear any problem in, in those words. The words, I think, I think, make perfect sense. If it's not clear, then you tell me why it's not clear. I thought it was a portion in Torah that means after the person is in Shemayim. After the person what? After the person is in, is in Shemayim. That part. I, I'm asking this. This is a petition to a Kodesh here and now. So it's not talking about later. It's talking about what I should should have while I'm alive. So, uh, okay. I mean, the, there are people who just can't learn. Um, there are people who just can't learn. So, what are the things that we have, which we use for questions like that, is Gilgal Neshamas reincarnation. So. When you look at a person's life from birth to death, that's one chapter out of a multi-chapter biography, and you haven't seen the other chapters. And what we're concerned with is that, in the world to come, this soul, with all of its chapters, will be able to be related. And since you don't know the other chapters, yeah, you can't draw the conclusion that because of this birth to death history, there was no connection to Torah, that the soul won't have a connection to the to Torah. I thought we just have to confess our ignorance because we don't know the rest of the career of that soul, both past and future. Okay. Then we say, satisfy us with your good. We talked about that when we talked about the, the blessing on, on uh, making a living. Cause us to rejoice in your salvation. That means... We're under pressure, we're under threat, and salvation here is a very broad term. And by the way, as I remember, as I told you, this is not redemption, this is salvation. Redemption always means going back to a prior condition. Salvation doesn't mean that. But this, you don't have, you don't have to think of war. This can, be, um, this can be illness, or it can be job worries, or anything that's threatening a person. And the joy is not that the danger goes away. The joy is that it's your salvation. So there's a wonderful Ketusha um, Slavi who was talking about Hanukkah and Purim. I'm just going to give you the tamsis, the, 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 the summary. Let's imagine that a person's driving a car on a mountain road, and loses control, and goes over the side, the door opens, and he, he flies out of the car, and he's caught on a branch. The car goes tumbling down 300 feet to the gorge, and it smashed the smithereens, and he's saved. Now, there are two different ways to register that event. One is, I was a dead man. There was no way I could survive that. The door opened, I flew out of the door and I was caught. It was absolutely unnatural. And I know how it happened. Because, because Baruch Hu saved me. Otherwise I would have been dead. And that's why I celebrate this miracle that Kodesh Baruch Hu did for me. That's one way to relate to it. There's another way to relate to it. The door opened and I flew out and ended on a tree. That's not natural. That's not natural at all. That's something which the laws of nature would never have dictated. Because Baruch Hu did a miracle. He 
showed me a miracle. He showed me his agency. He made it clear to me that he was interacting with me. That's a gigantic event in my life that he made himself that I could see him. Oh, oh, you want to know what happened? Well, actually, that, that's also important. Actually, if he hadn't done that, I'd have died. And he saved my life. That's true. Where's the emphasis? Is the emphasis on that I, my life was saved? And think about it. Hmm, how is it my life was saved? Because the Creator favored me with a miracle to, to save my life? Or is it that the Creator favored me with a miracle by which he showed himself to me, and also, yes, the miracle saved my life. Where is the emphasis? Is the emphasis on the benefit I received, which is then traced to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, Or is the emphasis on the fact that Kodesh Baruch Hu showed himself to me? This is the idea of cause us to rejoice through your salvation. The emphasis is on you acted for us. You showed yourself to us. We experienced your presence. That's why we're rejoicing over it. We're not rejoicing over it because we were in danger and then the danger went away. That's how it causes the rejoicing. Rejoicing is in the fact that you saved us. Just like I said, you should cause us to, uh, cause to be satisfied with your good. And I said this is Samech Bechelko. That person rejoices in the portion that a Kodesh Baruch Hu designated for him. The joy, the, the satisfaction in it is caused by the fact that I know that a Kodesh Baruch Hu chose this for me. So it's definitely right for me. So he's showing his care of me. Both of these are deeply relational. That's where the, where the effect is supposed to come from. Of course, the Shabbos is a time when the relationship to Kodesh Baruch Hu is much more intense, much more direct than it is during the week time. So that those, those sentiments are definitely implied. And purify our hearts to serve you with emes. Well, I guess if we're asking God's world to purify our hearts, we seem to be under the impression that our hearts aren't pure. That's probably not too un unreasonable. And now, what does the impurity in our hearts cost us? It costs us serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu with emes. So what we really ought to figure out is, what is emes on the first hand? And then secondly, what kind of impurities in the heart damage our ability to operate in, in terms of emes? I'm going to do this fairly superficially, but at least it will communicate some idea. What is MS? So uh, I've mentioned this before, but not so recently. You look into the dictionary, and MS means true, and Shechem means false, or MS means truth, the noun instead of the adjective. Uh, and I've told you that the dictionaries have lots of problems, lots of mistakes in them. And here, Odessa has a whole essay where he says that to translate MS as true is a mistake. And he has his discussion of it. And I read that many years ago, and I thought, why not? That's what the dictionaries say. Um, what's, what, 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 where linguistically is the complaint? And then I finally took out a concordance, and I looked up the word emes in the, in the Tanakh. And concordance is a list of all the words in the Tanakh and every one of the places where they occur. There are a few mistakes, but um, that's the idea. You can ch check and compare. And I discovered that often the Tanakh says, Emes is something you do. You do with me loving kindness and Emes. And then I thought, wait a second. Truth is not something you do. You don't classify actions as true and false. That's not a great classification. Actions can be smart or dumb, efficient or inefficient, productive or, in or unproductive. But they can't be true and false. So maybe, maybe there's something wrong with the idea. And then 
The Rambam says in the 10th chapter of Laws of Repentance that to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu, the Shema, for, for, for a Kodesh Baruch Hu's sake, one of the ways he puts it is, Osa ha-emes b'pnei emes. He does the emes because it's emes. The Rambam, who, who's, lang, who's Hebrew, is typically biblical Hebrew, says it straight out. You do the emes because it's emes. What's that? So if Dessler's understanding of emes is that which is ultimately true, absolute, necessary, and eternal. And Sheker is something which is either illusory entirely or only temporary, and it gives it promises false promises and doesn't pay them. And this is actually a Gemara in, in Shabbos, where it says the letters of Emes can stand, because the Aleph has two legs to stand on, and the Mem has a platform, and the Tuf also has two legs to stand on. And the letters of Sheker, which is the opposite of Emes, come to a point. The Shin is three lines coming to a point, and the Kuf has the straight line down on a point, and the Reish also stands on one leg. So Shek is ready to fall over, and Emes is established. That now, the Gemara, isn't telling me a feature of Emes. The Gemara is giving me a definition of Emes, which is much more appropriate, I think, for the Gemara to be doing. So now, what is it for us that is absolute, uh, eternal, permanent? That is a Baruch Hu in his, in his reality and his rotso, his will. So the question is to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu in terms of his will. That would mean that his will is my goal. That would mean to, to serve him in Emes. The Emes, like the Rambam says, you do the Emes because it's Emes. You do that which is eternal and permanent and, and absolute because it has those qualities, because it's more important than anything else. And that's because Baruch Hu's will. Okay, now what prevents me from doing that? Well, Ramchal, when he describes serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu, says something which, when I first read it, I was... It shook me. He says, to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu means to turn to him and to seek out closeness and attachment to him. So I thought to myself, aha, if the first element in serving Kodesh Baruch Hu is turning to him, I must be facing in the wrong direction, right? That's why I have to turn. Why doesn't it just say, seek out being close and, and, and attachment? No, because you're facing in the wrong direction. That's not good. And that's what it says. So there's something here that naturally distracts me from Kodesh Baruch Hu. The default position I would be in is pointing in the wrong direction. And the first step in serving is to turn in the right direction. What is that that turns me in the wrong direction? Ramchal says over and over again that it's the physical world. The purpose of the physical world, one of the purposes, is to hide Kodesh Baruch Hu. The word for olam, the word for world is olam, and by the way, that word in, in, in Hebrew, even in biblical Hebrew, stands for both space and time, which, given relativity, ought to be something to think about. Um, and it also, the verb, the, 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 the root of the verb, of the, of the word, refers to hiding something. So it's space and time which hides a Baruch Hu's presence. The natural world hides his presence. Even though you can do sophisticated studies and intelligent design and all the rest of that, which I think is, is, quite, is quite reasonable, but in general, everyday terms, without all the sophistication and all the calculation, the world looks like a place where the laws of nature uh, govern it. You don't see. It's not like the miracle of Kriyas Yamsuf, where the split, sea split. There you saw. But in the everyday, everyday uh, behavior, it's not so. So now, this attachment, immersion, psychological immersion in the, in the, in the physical world is what distract, it, one of the things that distracts us from the ultimate reality and prevents us from serving Kodesh Baruch Hu, Bahamas. When people talk about mitzvahs and talk about reasons for doing mitzvahs, 
even in our literature, some of them are, things will go better for you if you, if you do this mitzvah. Well, that's nice. That's what's called shalom l'shma. I'll get a benefit out of it. That's not serving Kodesh Baruch Hu in MS. MS means doing it because it's his will, because that's the most important thing you could possibly do. So I have to purge my heart of those things which distract me, which is my attachment to the physical world. Now, in comes marching, Shabbos, which says, don't do any physically creative actions. Wow. That's a cutoff. That's a cutoff from the normal involvement that I have in the physical world. I'm not going to cook my meals. I'm not going to answer my emails. I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm not going to fix the refrigerator. No, I'm not going to do any of those things. So I have a way of detaching myself from the normal immersion in the physical, and that can free me up for the focus on the Kodesh Baruch Hu. So that's one of the reasons why here in the Shabbos prayers, it says, purify our hearts to serve, to serve you in Emmas. Yeah. Um, does that mean that in, in Egypt, the, the work that was, that was forced upon us uh, made us disconnect from, it didn't allow us to think about spirituality at all? I think that's right. I think that's right. They didn't allow us to think about spirituality at all. The purpose of the work in Egypt was to depress the people to the point where they won't multiply. That's what triggered the oppression. There are too, there are too many Jews. They're going to take over. The idea of it wasn't to kill Jews. The idea of it was to depress them to the point where the population wouldn't grow. And indeed, as we said the other day, they succeeded with the men. The men gave up. The men were ready to see the end of the experiment. Only the women held on. Yeah. And then what, ha what happens after they go to grow? They will die out. After they go to grow? I don't after they will, won't be able to... If the purpose of slavery was to stop them from... Yeah, they didn't want slaves. They didn't want slaves. The, the, when it says... when. when Pharaoh expresses his motivation for, for making them slaves. He doesn't mention anything about free labor. This is a mis misconception. The, the Midrash tells us that they assigned Jews, men and women, they were both working, men to women's labor and women to men's labor. That's not a way, that's not a recipe for efficiency. No, the point was to depress them. There's a story, there's a book called To Vanquish the Dragon, which is the history of a group of Beis Yaakov girls in the Second World War. I, I remember, one, it's a wonderful book, it's a very worthwhile reading. Um, the, the, one of the episodes, one of the girls was in one of these um, work camps, um, and she was a seamstress. And of course, she had to work 24-7. But she was so good that she, she sewed extra garments above their, above their quota. And in Shabbos, she pretended to be working. And when they asked for her product, she would pull out of the garment that she had showed, sold on, during the weekday. Right? So she re recounts it. And then she says, and I was a very good seamstress. So my, my um, garments were of highest quality. And therefore, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't catch me and they didn't, they didn't criticize me. So... In describing what she's doing, she's taking pleasure in the fact that she's a good seamstress. And the garments were good garments. Right? The Egyptians were, were cleverer than that. Don't let her do that. Make her carry bricks so she'll have no satisfaction in what she's doing. So she'll just be depressed. People who do a good job have a certain satisfaction from it and builds them up. Even if you're working for the Roman, the, the Germans, and even if it's wartime and so forth and so on, so they, they were not interested in in the value of the slave labor. Slave labor, yes. When they sent them away, and then Pharaoh changed his mind, and he said, "We sent them away from serving us." Maybe that evolved into part of it, but that was not the purpose in the beginning. It says, "Laman anosam b'siv 
in order to um, oppress them with their burdens. To oppress them, not to get free, free labor so we can build storehouse, storehouse cities. That wasn't, that wasn't the purpose of it. Yeah? Yeah. Good for you. It is. And in fact, this is a paraphrase. It's, it's in a verse in Isaiah, in, in, in Jeremiah. There it says, Hashem Elohim Emes. So when we add the word Emes to the end of the Shema, we are referencing that Pasuk in, in, in Yermio. And, 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 that, and of course, if you read it straight, it's in a positive. I mean, when you have a noun and a noun and a noun, what you're saying is that, that the nouns all describe the same thing. And that's what it is. Yes, Hashem Elohim Emes. He is Emes. It's not true in the adjective sense, and true is the wrong word altogether. He is Emes. That's why it says in the Gemara, Chosamo Emes, that his signature is Emes. A signature is the name for who you are, isn't it? That's what a signature is. His chosam is the word emes. Emes is who he is. It's not, it's not uh, you know, it's, it's like a proper name rather than just an adjective that describes a quality. It's like everlasting and, and what, what else is it? Absolute, everlasting, necessary, you know, not accidental, those qualities, yeah. So like the Chabi made it to serve you, that's the... Like yeah, well, that's right. La, avdecha means to serve you. Right. And be'emes is the way in which I serve you. I serve you by appreciating that you are the ultimate reality, that you are the ultimate source of all value, that you are more important than anything else, and that's why I serve you. And that requires purification, because if I'm not focused totally on the Kodesh Baruch Hu, then I'll have divided motivations. And I'll think, you know, that these laws are, you know, Shabbos is wonderful, it lowers your blood pressure. You get a day off, you relax, you know, and then it takes it easy. And it's much better for your relationship to your family. You know, that's not serving Kodesh Baruch Hu be That's it's not true? It is true. It's 100% true. But when you do that, when you do it that way, you're not doing, you're not serving Kodesh Baruch Hu because he is the ultimate reality. Because Rokha now becomes a means by, way, by which your independent, self-centered world becomes, becomes better. That's not serving him to MS. But if it's a fair, it changes it? I'm sorry? If, if it's a fair, it comforts my life, right? Oh, I'm not saying you shouldn't, that it shouldn't happen. It, 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 because Rokha built the world in such a way that these things will happen. And you can be grateful for the fact that when you do the mitzvah, it has these, these consequences, and that's a benefit that he's giving you. But that isn't the why of doing it. Like the, the Nefesh Chaim says, we, we usually say you shouldn't serve a Kodesh Baruch. The ideal is not to serve a Kodesh Baruch for the world to come. Rambam says it word for word over there in chapter 10. The Nefesh Chaim says there's a way in which you could. If you serve a Kodesh Baruch for the world to come because he wants you in the world to come, not because the world will come will be wonderful for you, for you, but because he wants you there, then your desire to get to the world to come is, is part of your serving him for him. That's a big madrega, because when you figure, figure out what the world to come is, the little that we can, we can have any appreciation of it, to say that, yeah, yeah, but I only want to get there because he wants me to be there, that's a job. But that would be a way of, of, of incorporating it into your service of the Kodesh Baruch Okay, very good.